these dogs, there's there's some stuff I want to get into because I know you're I I know you're a good trainer and I know you have some specialty stuff that I really want to get into. But um, one of the things that I got asked quite a bit, we've we've done a few episodes where we've touched on English cockers. And they they seem to just generally be getting more popular. I don't know if you're seeing that or not. I think there's more awareness. And yeah. I think, you know, I, I had somebody ask me the other day, like, why why would you go with one? And I was like, well, have you met them? Like, you know, part of the reason people love golden retrievers is that personality. Like if you mm-hmm. if you're thinking about having an awesome uh, house dog or a, an awesome companion, that golden retriever type personality is so tough to beat. And I feel like English cockers are in that realm with just like kind of goofy, like love you, whatever you need, boss personality. And it's awesome. Yeah. So, so I guess the question is why would anybody get a cocker, right? Sure. That's what you're looking for. (laughs) So they're definitely not like a little golden, right? Maybe that personality kind of like that. I'm not even sure. They, They definitely are highly intelligent, lots of personality dog, right? They also are, they're fairly high energy. So if you're looking for just a lap dog, uh, they're, they're not a lap dog. Like they like to have a job. They, I mean, you, uh, you've seen mine in person, like they like to work. Yep. So if they're just laying around all the time, they're not, especially for that first year or two of their lives, they're not really just like a good lay around, do nothing lap dog. They're, they're definitely a hunting dog like through and through hunting yep. is definitely their that that's their first objective in life there's a little bit and without getting too far into the weeds here there's a lot of speculation on what all is in a cocker from a breeding standpoint because there's definitely been things introduced over the years and none of this is confirmed but it's you know people will say well it's just a miniature springer right like springers and cockers used to be the same breed and then the smaller ones became cockers and the bigger ones became springers uh, it, it makes no sense to me because there's about 20 different colors of cockers and there's two primary colors of springers. Mm-hmm. So something else was introduced there. There's certainly some springer in the cockers. There's maybe some terrier in there. There's probably some setter in there. There's a lot of speculation that there's probably some border collie in there. So there are a variety of breeds and then springer, of course, as well. So if you've been around border collies at all, and I'm not saying a cocker is a border collie. But if that's in there, like, you know that these dogs like to work and they're highly intelligent. So if they have nothing to entertain their mind, like they can become destructive dogs. Like they, they find things to do. Like if you don't give them something, they'll find something. So I, I, I sh- certainly wouldn't want your listeners to think, boy, I just want a nice dog that'll sit on the couch next to me for hours on end and that I can let it out to go pee and it comes back in and lays on the couch again. They're, yeah. they're not necessarily that dog. And I think some... Like you talked about goldens, I think some of the goldens are more that way, where they're yep. just really, really laid back, calm dogs. The cockers are definitely more of a working dog than that. Yeah, they're definitely way higher drive. <laughs> yeah, definitely way higher drive. But they are like a fun dog. Like you can't be around them and not just like enjoy them and and have fun with them because they're they're always making you laugh. They're goofy. Like some of them do just the craziest things. Like what what was that dog thinking? Like mm-hmm. I'll, I'll give a story there. I have. In my basement, I have my kennel set up. I have three foot by six foot chain link runs, uh, amongst other things down there. And I had a dog at one time. He was a male. His name was Sammy. He was a couple years old at the time. And he figured out how to open up his run, which I know a lot of dogs figure out how to open those runs. They flip the latch up. He was so good at it, though. Like He knew if it was closed or not. He knew if there was a snap on it or not. If he saw the snap, he wouldn't try. If the snap wasn't there, he would very intentionally open the latch, not just a random flail my feet and see if this gate opens. Like he knew exactly how to open it. And it was always, he was the only dog that did it. So it was always hard to remember, did we put the snap on his run or not? So it, he caused a lot of heartache that way. <laughs> and what, what he ended up doing, if, if he wasn't, if the, if the snap wasn't on the latch, he would let himself out. And then he would go down the line of runs and he would let out all the females not the males, just the females. And he did this, he did this multiple times. So like maybe we're gone in town for something. We come back and Sammy's out in the basement with all the girls. And and the other, let's say we had three other males, I think at the time, the other three males are just sitting in their runs. Like, geez, why can't we join the party? And Sammy's out there just living it up with, with the females. And it, it, the first time it happened, it was like, oh, that's pretty funny. He let the females out. 
by the third time, like he never let another male out ever, but he would always let females out. That's a, to me, that's a really like intelligent dog, a little bit mischievous. Uh, but th- there's a lot of brains behind that to intentionally go do that. That's incredible. I mean, that, that, that the thought behind that to not only get yourself free, <laughs> but then to go, yeah, none free of these girls. dudes are getting out. It's it's going to be <laughs> yeah. me. I mean, that's amazing. Um, you, you said something earlier that I, I, I want to just go back and touch on for a second, uh, kind of along those sure. lines. So, um, when you when you talk about an English cocker and you look at them, they're one of those breeds, you know. And, and this is highly subjective, but it, they're cute their whole lives. Like they're they're always they're adorable dogs. When you see an adult English cocker, you're like that is it, it, oh, it's like an adorable dog, and it's little. Right. And so, do you get people looking for those dogs, not for the performance, ignoring the drive that the attention needs, the the exercise and work that they need, just because they look at it and they go, "Oh my God, that's a cute dog. I want to have those one of those in my house." Yeah, de- definitely. Yeah, and and for those people, like if you want a cocker, but you don't do anything, you have a pretty sedentary lifestyle. They just go get a showbread cocker at that point. Yep. You know, they still have a nice personality. They're going to be way more relaxed in the house. Like it'll be a, it will be a more rewarding experience for you as an owner. If you don't want your dog to do anything yep. now, that doesn't mean I'll sell puppies to homes that aren't necessarily hardcore hunting homes. You know, if you're doing agility or you hike a lot or, yeah, you know, whatever you have some activity you want to do with your dog, that's fine with me. But but I do want my buyers of puppies to know like this is a dog that's going to require something in its life. Like don't get it just to be a lap dog. Yep. So can I go, I'm going to go back and finish that thought earlier. Like why would somebody buy a cocker? Sure. If that's all right. Cause I feel yeah. like I, I left that open a little bit. So if, if I were recommending a cocker to somebody, the reason would be one, it is like a really fun dog to have around a lot of personality. They're a cool dog for sure. They're a cool dog. From a hunting perspective, so my background, like I talked about earlier, was retrievers, upland hunting with retrievers. The the cockers, in my opinion, are a better upland dog than a retriever in most cases. Certainly, there's exceptions to it. They cover ground better. They're more fun to watch. They're they're a flashy dog. Most of them are pretty natural retrievers, like really natural at retrieving. Um, Good noses, like they've got good trailing ability. Uh, they're just, I, I don't, they're really, really nice hunting dog. So not when I originally bought a cocker, it was because I lived in an apartment and didn't have space. Mm-hmm. Now I live out in the country. I've got land all around me. I've got kennels. You know, I have, I have a lot more space and I could go get any breed of dog that I wanted to. I am getting a couple of labs for different reasons. I have no desire to replace my cockers as upland hunting dogs with another breed because they, they do everything that I want them to do. Mm-hmm. So it's a super nice hunting dog that's also in a small package with a lot of personality. Yep. And and on your point earlier, um, that, you know, they're, they're working dogs. They need jobs. Like you said, if they've got some collie in there and you've seen a, if you've seen a collie work, you understand this. But in, in general terms, working dogs, sporting dogs need jobs. They mm-hmm. thrive with a structured life where they have tasks to accomplish. And it doesn't, like you said, it doesn't have to be hunting pheasants, you know, adventure dogs. I was talking to Mike Stewart with uh, Wild Rose Kennels the other day. I was interviewing him for a, a meat eater article and he was talking about how many adventure dogs they're training now to kayak and to hike and to just be outdoors with people, not in a hunting capacity, just, mm-hmm. just working, doing cool stuff. And if you if you want an English cocker or any other dog that has been bred to for a task or multiple tasks, don't don't get them and ask them to sit on the couch. <laughs> Take them out right. and work them work because that's what they need. That's what they love. That's what they're there for. That's right. So I, I, agree. I, I, I always yeah, I know you do. I always yeah. I always like to touch on that. So you've said several times um, that you, you know, you were living in Iowa when you picked up your first English cocker, you were looking for an upland hunter. Um, you thought you think they perform better than retrievers uh, in that capacity. Does anybody is anybody duck hunting with these things? Do you know anybody out there? Yeah, definitely. I've done a little bit of duck hunting with mine, although that is it's been a while. It's not really my thing right now at this point in my life. But 
most of them like very readily take to the water and I can do when I focus on doing blinds, like Rocky was that, that first dog I started trialing. Yep. He was, I put a lot of time into him with handling stuff and I could easily do 150 yard blind with that dog. I could handle him. I could, I could, uh, you know, do launch a dummy 70 yards out into a lake and send him for it. And he would, he would go out there and retrieve it for me. So, and, and they certainly can pick up a duck as well. No problem. Mm-hmm. At least most of them can. Um, they aren't great in cold water late season. So if you're planning on going to a big lake that maybe has some white caps coming in and you're going to be dumping a bunch of ducks out there, that that's not what they're intended for, right? That's, it's a little bit too much for them. Yep. If it's early season teal hunting or wood duck or puddle jumping, that it's a great application for them. So as long as your expectations are reasonable, um, you know, if it's a, maybe you're hunting ducks over corn or something like that. Yeah. Great for that. Yep, it's just yeah. that late season. If they're going to have to sit there while they're wet, their body's not made for that. Yeah. So w- w- uh, on that note, you know, if you, if, if somebody's thinking about an English cocker and they're like, oh, I hunt early season, uh, wood ducks on small water or whatever, you know, you still have to do a water introduction with them. Um, you know, you, you have to get them introduced to the water correctly. So would you say, just be a little more careful about the water introduction with them. So the water temp is good. The, the experience is positive because the, the water introduction thing, you know, a lot of people take it for granted with dogs. If you get a mm-hmm. lab or something, you just think, Hey, that, that dog's going to take to water. Sometimes they don't, <laughs> you know, like right. some, sometimes right. they jump off the dock and go in over their head in 50 degree water and they go, uh, this is not for me. And it, it changes them for life. So you have to be careful. Yeah. So I, I look at water d- introduction the same way I look as at intro intro to gunfire. Most cockers, like any breed, any hunting breed, would be totally fine with water. No how much you no matter how much you screwed it up, right? They just they'll just take to it. But there are going to be some that, eh, you know, maybe they they're not just as, as fond of it as others. So it's better to just be safe and introduce them all in the same way. So what's the point of trying to get a puppy to swim in cold water if you could wait a month and put them in warm water might as well make it as fun for them as possible and you may be able to throw a a retrieve off of a ledge and have a puppy jump in and retrieve it but maybe not so you might as well start them all off with a nice sloping bank where they can touch the bottom for the first few feet and then they lose the bottom and they start swimming so it's just it's safer so same as intro to gunfire most dogs, you could go out there and flush a bird and shoot it, and that dog's not even going to hear the gunfire, and it's just going to go retrieve the bird, right? But there are going to be some puppies that stop and say, what the heck was that? That terrified me. I don't ever want to hear that again. And now you've got all that extra work to break a, a dog of that. So it's way better to just gradually teach water the same way that you would gradually teach yeah, intro to gunfire. Yep. Well, and it, those, those two things are pretty commonly uh, associated with lessons with a dog that if you screw them up, coming back from them is not Way impossible, right. <laughs> but can be a monumental task. And, you know, we know that with gunfire, you, you know, if you screw that up, it's you may have a dog that you'll never hunt with. It, it, it may go that bad. the The water introduction doesn't usually carry as much weight with people, especially if you if you bought right. a dog like this, where you're like, oh, you know, I love to hunt pheasants, I love to hunt grouse, whatever. Maybe I'll hunt some ducks, and so you might not take it as seriously. But it sure. it it's a good thing. It's an easy thing to do correctly if you follow the steps and you make sure the introduction is. There's no fear. There's not going to be any fear. It's a simple thing they can get into and it's comfortable. Um, you just just remember that what you know. No matter what kind of dog you're trying to introduce to those things. That's right. Yeah. The the risk reward is so heavily weighted toward just do it right. <laughs> like, whether. <laughs> You know, you might come out okay by taking shortcuts, but it's almost guaranteed you'll come out okay if you do it the right way. So just do it the right way. Yeah, for sure. Have you, um, just just because for my own curiosity, do you have anybody who's shed hunting with English cockers? I do. I have one dog that I sold that uh, went to a, a couple in the Midwest, and they actually use it in the shed dog competition even. So okay. I think that's the only one that I know of, but... I'd say like six years ago, somebody asked me if the do- if these cockers could do that. And I had, I had Rocky 
at the time. And I took, so I was like, well, I was going to show to show them that these dogs could find sheds. I took like 20 minutes to teach him to retrieve antlers. And then I started hiding antlers in the woods and he was finding them. So really any dog that has a high retrieve drive and a nose yep. is going to, you can turn that into a shed dog pretty easily. Yep. Yeah. I, I think, you know, we get asked about it a lot and I just think shed dog training is generally way easier than a lot of other kinds of training. It's oh yeah. Yeah. You're not even asking them to stay at a certain distance or anything. Like just you'll run around and if you smell antlers, bring them to me. Right. Yeah. That's smell or see them. I mean, they, yeah, they learn, yeah. they learn the visual side of it too, but it's just, it's such an easy hunt to set up, you know, in the neighborhood park, in the backyard, you can't do the average person can't set up a real pheasant hunt or a, or, you know, like a, 90% of the way to a real pheasant hunt all that easily, you can set up a shed hunt in, like you said, no time at all. And I'm, I'm when, what, what you said there about taking 20 minutes to teach Rocky how to, how to find antlers. Um, you said something about him w- way back in this conversation about how you would, uh, you know, introduce something to that dog. And five minutes later, it was like, he's got it. Um, yeah. And I, I, I meant to ask you about that. How did you know, was it just through sheer repetition in the following days that you, you figured out that wasn't a false positive? Yeah. At the time I had no clue what I was doing. Um, now I, I false, po- I don't really ever think of false positives, I guess, because the way that I do things now, it's very incremental and they show me that they understand it before we go on to the next thing. And if they show me that they understand it, which means they'll do it without being forced to do it, like then, then I know they have it. So, so I found actually, and this is complete uh, going into the weeds here, but I found that, and, and I think maybe in the second half of this podcast, we'll talk about this a little bit more, but I found that early on when I force dogs to do things, so either by restraint or by correction, those, those lessons did not stick as well. Like they would forget about that restraint or they would forget about that correction. And I had to always go back and and do these things over and over and over again. And before a competition, I was always, I was training right up until the last minute, just hoping that the lesson stuck long enough to carry through a field trial. And my, my training has definitely evolved now to where it's let's, let's let the dog take some ownership of this process and some of the, the onus for doing it correctly, I guess. And that's, uh, boy, this is really in all, I've listened to a lot of your podcasts where it's like you had the border collie guy on and you've had the, the drug detection and all that. And these, these we're all kind of doing the same thing in that now we're really trying to get dogs to where they want to do these jobs because of the reward that's at the end. So they're very focused on doing it the right way. And I've, because they want the reward, not because they're afraid of a correction. Yep. And I found that by doing it that way, these lessons stick so much better where I can take a finished dog, put it away for two or three weeks, bring it back out. And it's like the dog never took any time off. It picks up right where it left off because it's engaged in the game. It's a game for it, right? It, it knows how it's supposed to do it. It knows how to win the game. So it comes out and it wants to win the game. It's not jerking my chain and it's not forgetting about a correction that happened it's remembering the positive thing at the end so you this that's interesting so do you think they're learning i don't i don't know if this is the right way to put this or not do you think when you when you're doing you're structuring your training so it's a positive confidence building thing where they they know the reward is going to be there in a positive way versus being afraid of a correction that they're mm-hmm. like those lessons are sticking better like it's it almost sounds like they're learning differently through that 100 percent. oh okay yes yes for sure for sure. You'll, you'll find like they, they're more engaged in the process and it's not coming from a position of fear or restraint. It's coming from a position of like, you, you look at these drug dogs and why are they doing that job? Like, why are they going and sniffing for marijuana? Is it because they like marijuana? Maybe, I don't know, but they may, but what they're really doing is they want the tennis ball at the end. I know if I find that I get the tennis ball. So I'm going to go look for that stuff as hard as I can knowing when I find it, I get the reward at the end. Yep. You take that same principle and apply it to a hunting dog. If we can teach that dog that when it does the right thing, it gets a reward at the end. Now it's going to like, once they figure that gig out, then they, boy, 
the faster I can do my job the right way, the faster I'm going to get my reward. Mm -hmm. And 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 it sticks. Well, and so what, what, what is neat about that is I think you would think, or the, the average dog trainer would look at this and go, the quickest way from point A to point B is going to be to correct. Just just drive this freaking lesson home, make it stick. And that will be the most efficient way to make this dog listen. And you're saying, actually, it's more efficient to figure out how to work with their natural desire to please and learn and get rewarded. And that actually becomes not only a better way to get those lessons to stick, but a more efficient way to train. Yeah, definitely. And I, I'm not a, I'm not advocating like a no correction type training. My dogs all have received corrections and I'm, the corrections are different for each dog. Some need more, some need less. But we're all, I'm, I'm always trying to get them back to a place of learning and being rewarded. You don't want to dwell in a constant state of correction and restraint. We go there just so that we have a contrast to what's what's positive, right? Like mm-hmm. like a positive reward is only positive because of what a negative is. It's, it's all relative. So we do have to show them, hey, if you want to play the game your way, you get this correction. If you'll play it my way, you get this reward at the end. Mm-hmm. It doesn't take a real smart dog to figure that concept out that, hey, if I play it this way, I get that reward. If I play it the other way, there's a correction that comes. Well, let's not go there. Let's just stay where it's happy and positive. 